test one, two. About ever since and uh, others have come to us and uh, asked for prayers about people in their family that they would have a relationship within their family or even without their family where they could have an influence to bring someone to Jesus. And so those are some things that I thought about when I thought about what would you, what would you respond if, uh, if Jesus said, what can I do for you? Uh, you know, help, help me to know what to say that a soul or souls might be saved throughout eternity. What we pray for missionaries. We pray for people that we know, Elsa and Dale Deverney and the uh, Mervin in um, Honduras, uh, Carlos Perdomo, others that we know of, that they would uh, save souls, rescue souls for eternity. So anyway, that's that's kind of what. What I came to my mind as I saw that, uh, because you receive your sight, your faith has healed you. If we have faith, if we have faith, uh, the Lord can work with that. So any, anyway, we'll go on. <laughs> Just, uh, the chap chapter 19 talks about an incident that's famous uh, if, if you've been to Sunday school because it talks about a, a man who climbed up in a tree to see Jesus. And, uh, we, you know, you depict that on the flannel board or through the, the art or through the, uh, the things. And uh, that's, that's kind of interesting uh, to kids. Uh, because it's kind of an extreme to go to, to see Jesus. What kind of a man was this who did that? Climbed in a sycamore tree to see Jesus. <clears throat> he was a, a tax collector and therefore the Jews considered him to be a sinner. Okay. He was a tax collector. He was a wealthy man. And often the wealth of a tax collector came from the fact that he collected as much as he could from the people. He remitted to the Roman authorities what uh, he could get by remitting to them and then kept the difference and uh, lived on that. And so sometimes uh, those were very lucrative positions. So, you know, he's not just... Uh, you know, someone off the street. He's a, a dignified citizen, and yet, uh, you know, he does what it takes to see Jesus. <laughs> you know, how many times would we see a, a wealthy man climbing up into a tree for anything? <laughs> but anyway, uh, he. If you're short he's, enough, he'll do that. <laughs> what's that? He's, if you're short enough, you'll do a lot of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's almost like a midget or something. <laughs> Some of us may be a little bit uh, worried that we would break the branches if we got up there, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he has a house and, a, you know, he can entertain. So he welcomed him gladly, and uh, it, Jesus was criticized. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner, because this was kind of an outcast of society. He's collaborating with the occupying authority. And uh, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So uh, wh what do you think of this guy? Is, is he, uh, you know, was this just giving out of his abundance or is he sincere or, you know, what do you, what do you think of Zacchaeus, good or bad? <clears throat> his, his heart and his mind seem to, to have been open 
to, to Jesus. Yeah. They went to an extreme to see him. <clears throat> he seems to have had a sensitivity for the poor. He says, uh, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated, he seems to be an honest tax collector, uh, which the Jews would probably say, how can there be such a thing? Uh, <clears throat> if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Seems he's saying he's an honest man. And Jesus says, uh, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Uh, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus says, you know, he, he, this man is, is worthy of, uh, well, not worthy, but he has uh, uh, done works suggesting that uh, he is seeking the good. So he says, salvation has come to this house. Would you like for Jesus to come over and visit you and say, salvation has come to this house? Yes. I think we'd all like that. He's kind of saying, you know, in spite of, uh, in spite of him um, cheating and having this bad reputation, um, Jesus still loved him. Okay. Regardless okay. of, yeah. He still loved him. Uh, we don't know. I don't know. Maybe he didn't cheat. <laughs> you know? Or if he did, maybe it was an honest mistake that he tried to rectify. Uh, some in the, he, he depicted here as a tax collector. The other depiction of a tax collector, uh, chapter two back, is uh, one who was honestly uh, seeking forgiveness if he'd done yeah. wrong. Right. Uh, Two, two things. Two things kind of strike me that uh, if he if he is cheating, uh, paying back four times the amount, uh, he's going to be he's going to go through his his <laughs> he's going to go through his wealth pretty quickly, pay, paying back paying back at that rate. Uh, right. <laughs> the other thing is um, he uh, the law. I think the law required you to pay double recompense for. Uh, for damages and things like that. So it seems like maybe what he's, what he's doing is taking what the law requires and, and doubling it. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, whatever he might've done in the past, uh, you know, the, his, his actions here indicate that he, uh, he's repenting. He's, he's, yeah, he he's is. turning back from that and trying to make it right. And so, uh, whether he's a cheater or not, I mean, his actions here are, 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 you know, we we should copy that. <laughs> we we should you know we should yeah, kind yeah. of live that way and follow that example. So. I think it shows he had a strong conscience. You know, yeah, he's feeling bad about what he did. You see people today. You wonder if they got any conscience at all, the way they operate. You know, he's brought forth a works uh, that suggest repentance. Works meet for repentance in the old language. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, now Zacchaeus, you got to get out of that job. You got to quit being a tax collector. You can't work for the Romans and be a follower of God. He didn't say that to him, does he? He says, this day salvation has come to your house. And he doesn't say, now Zacchaeus, like he said to the rich young ruler, you got to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He doesn't say that to him. He Maybe that... What's rich that? Yeah, the rich young ruler had a heart problem. Okay. He loved money. Evidently, so this that, guy doesn't have that same problem. Yeah, that he got other problems. <laughs> suggests that he doesn't have that problem. So, anyway, what what's the lesson uh, there? I guess that you, uh, you you know maybe he blesses this man, and the Lord blesses Zacchaeus that he can continue to give a lot of money to the poor half of his income and, and do these things. And uh, of course, the lesson that we teach in the Sunday school is what, go out, go out of your way to hear the words of Jesus if it's necessary, do what's necessary to, to hear Jesus. 
I, I heard an interesting take on the Zacchaeus versus the rich young ruler one time, and, I, <laughs> and it's always kind of stuck with me. The rich run, young ruler asked God what he could do to get salvation, and God said, give up everything and follow me. Zacchaeus came down and said, God, I'm giving up half my stuff, and I'm, and I'm going to make up for everything I've done wrong, and God says, okay. And the, the, the person that was talking said, the moral of the story is don't wait for God to tell you what to do. Okay. <laughs> Go out and do something and maybe he won't ask for everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, he does in a sense, you know, that uh, it's got to be realized that everything is God's. Uh, so, okay, well, that's one that, uh, we remember this version now talks about the next uh, account is the parable of the 10 minas. I never heard of a mina, but uh, that's what it says here in the New International Version. If you go back to the, uh, the original, the King James Version, it says the 10 pounds because that was uh, the translated where the pound was the uh, unit of currency. But uh, it's, there's another place where there's a discussion of talents. But here, it's some kind of a, a sum of money. And uh, it was 100 so denarii, 100 days wages. Yeah, that's what, 100 days wages. That's what, yeah, about what I've seen about three months wages, a goodly sum. So... Uh, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So we get a little bit of an inkling of what is being expected as Jesus and his retinue are approaching Jerusalem. And we're going to see how what comes of that later in this chapter. <laughs> But it so that's the purpose of this story or this parable. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. So each one got one. <laughs> But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Not a bad return on investment. You'd want to uh, work with this guy, right? Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. Calls it small. Second came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. Still pretty good, but not quite the return of the first guy. Uh, his master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. So what is this? Oh, it's an interesting story. We've heard <laughs> time after time. 
uh, if we've been around uh, studying the Bible long enough. But what does it have to do with Jesus' purpose to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once? I picture um, people uh, kicking back and relaxing because, well, the kingdom of God is going to come and, uh, you know, everything will be made better. And, uh, Rome was going to fall and leave us alone and, uh, um, and I don't have to do a thing about it. And uh, I think the, the parable is um, Jesus saying that the kingdom of God is something you have to work towards and um and make real yourself through your own actions um and uh your hard work okay yeah so he's he's saying you can't just you know give up we read later in the new testament about some people who thought jesus was coming immediately kind of quit work evidently and uh, but jesus is saying he's going away and he'll come back and he will expect uh, good stewardship while he's gone. Good stewardship. We don't think a lot about that, that we are just stewards or, you know, keepers of the things we have. We tend to have that uh, concept more of ownership uh, than stewardship. But that's what he's emphasizing here, isn't he? Um, and good stewardship in the parable is investment, right? It's not just it's not okay. keeping it it's not keeping it wrapped up in a in a right. in a cloth and and oh I'm, you know let's go let's get together on Sundays and and thank you know praise God for our mina. It's it's you know it, it's we 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 go to work with it. We we and we better be about the master's business with it. We better be about you know yeah. our, our master's business with with what he's given us. And that's seemingly sort of the the um, the the way that will be looked at and evaluated when when the kingdom does does come and and the king does return and and it's a it's a kind of a <laughs> strong a startling parable we think well what about grace and, and grace is there but it's it's very it's it's very specifically you know this is what we're we're to be doing this is what we're to be about yeah. and um, and and his work in the world is 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 what our responsibility is. Um, so how do we make some minus <laughs> or some pounds <laughs> how do you do that in the world uh, you know you can there's investment advisors out there that supposedly they advertise all the time don't they you get mail and you see them on tv and make a, is that what he's talking about well there's a while they were listening to this in verse 11 so you have to think there's a connection to the Zacchaeus story and that this okay. occurred at the same time. So you can picture the people, um, you know, whispering about, uh, whispering to themselves about, you know, how scandalous it was that Jesus was eating with a sinner and a tax collector. And the parable is Jesus' way of saying, um, Zacchaeus is uh, um, making good on his, investment he's helping he's helping people who need help he's um correcting the wrongs he's done and he deserves to be called a good and faithful servant okay and Zacchaeus is uh, getting a return on his investment in a sense by laying up treasures in heaven rather than on earth and there's so much emphasis in our lives about it <laughs> Treasures on earth, not a whole lot about laying up treasures in heaven. How do you use the mammon of unrighteousness and make friends, as Jesus taught earlier, to lay up treasures in heaven? Uh, so that's how you, you go about it. Again, it gets back to preaching the gospel. It gets back to converting people. It gets back to ministering to those in need and uh, Jesus will bless those efforts some more than others uh, some maybe more 
identifiable than others. But it's, it's not good to say, well, I was expecting the kingdom of heaven, so I just laid back and did nothing. Um, the intriguing thing to me is, um, well done, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Um, uh, what are those additional blessings? Or are they blessings, or are they responsibilities that come? I guess, you know, you've been trustworthy in a small matter. He calls the use of the minas a small matter, although has that 100 days wages or whatever. Uh, that was a considerable sum of money for somebody at that time, because the vast majority of people live day to day. Uh, I just, what do you, what do you think about those cities? <laughs> well, they were, they were responsibilities, but with responsibilities come blessings too, you know. Okay, yeah. Where it works. I'm not sure in the kingdom of God you distinguish between blessings and responsibilities. I think, okay. I think they're... <clears throat> One and the same. I, I, I think to be entrusted with some type of, of responsibility or some type, we're all, we're all given roles in God's kingdom. We're all given things that we can do. We're all given things that, that, uh, that we can, uh, ways that we can administer God's blessings to the people around us. Um, and, and I, I, I think it's a blessing to be given that, but it's also a responsibility. And, and I think we embrace them equally, you know. Like use our talents. Use our and talents. That, that would uh, multiply uh, God's kingdom. You, you know, it, it make it expand yeah. bigger. Yeah. And yeah. especially if we're able to take care of the smaller things, you know, perhaps from one person to another, if we're able to fulfill that need, then we're showing God that we know what we have. And so he's more likely to increase that because if we can't be trusted with the smaller things, he has no reason to give us the 10 cities or to give us the, the bigger thing. Cause we haven't learned how to, how to manage yeah. what we have. Yeah. So it, it strikes me that the King going away and, and, coming back and, and, and that uh, that we all God's kingdom isn't just something that we sit back and enjoy the benefit of even I think after Christ returns I you know we sort of have the picture of you know laying lay on clouds strumming harps or whatever <laughs> and, and I don't I don't think uh, I, I don't think first of all heaven will be non-instrumental non of course but I, 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 I do think that we you know that we uh, uh, that we that the kingdom of God is is um, something in which we find or we'll find a role and we'll find a responsibility and we'll, we'll have things to do. And, and I don't think it'll be just uh, kind of what we, we sometimes anticipate of, you know, and just well, uh, extended vacation, you know, I, I, that, that, you know, we'll, there'll be stuff to do and, and we'll in some way, and I don't understand it, but in some way we'll share in the reign of Christ and will we'll not just be subjects, but will in some way share in the reign of, of Jesus. And there, there's things he says that sort of imply that he, you know, yeah. talk about the, um, uh, he just, there's, there are things he says that imply that. And, and um, even the Daniel seven passage that the son of man stuff is, seems to be based on is all those Kings that are stripped of their responsibility are, that, that, that power is given to the people of the Most High, not just the king, but the, the, the saints, you know, the people of God. So I, I just think that maybe the, 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 the idea is, is that there'll be, there'll be stuff to do, and it'll be a responsibility, but it'll also be a great blessing. And, and, and part of the life that we'll enjoy with God will be uh, that purpose that he gives us. So... If we want to enjoy that life more, we need to uh, identify what Linda pointed out as the talents, and that, that's the word that's used in a similar par a par parable, and uh, identify those and 
put them to use, and that will be seen. It, you know, it's seen in the world. If you have talent and put it to use, people will see that, and they'll want to give you jobs to do. Uh, and uh, you grow in your abilities and in your responsibilities in uh, the business world, the artistic world, whatever world you're in, and uh, in the world of the kingdom, it's the same. And so, you know, we evaluate our progress in uh, terms of the world, in terms of dollars so often, or in terms of job title uh, and other measures of success. Do we take the trouble to look at our lives as servants in the kingdom and seek to evaluate whether we're making progress. Do we ever have the courage to ask someone else, <laughs> you know, am I making any progress spiritually? Most of us are too scared to do that because we might learn the truth of what other people really think of us. But that's a part of the, uh, the, the familyness of the church, isn't it? That we have that trust and courage that we can go to someone and say, you know, do you think I'm growing spiritually in any way? Or am I just like the one uh, minor man? <laughs> I'm just marking time in a spiritual sense. So those are some tough questions. Uh, you know, maybe it takes courage also to, you know, Jesus says we need to be concerned about one another to such an extent that we will talk to one another about spiritual things and spiritual progress and uh, spiritual mistakes that are made. The easy way is just, you know, every person for himself or herself, I don't want to I don't want to bother you, and I don't want you to bother me. <laughs> we'll just kind of stay in our own silos and uh, continue on. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question about responsibilities in in heaven. And there are suggestions of uh, reigning with Christ, and but uh, we'd like to know more about that. Um, we better uh, maybe try to talk briefly about the, uh, the, the latter part of this chapter. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Must be somebody who knew the Lord. Those who were sent ahead and found it just as he had told them as they were untying it, its owners asked, why are you untying the coat? They said, the Lord needs it. So uh, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat and put Jesus on it. And he went along, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And uh, this is another scene which is celebrated in Sunday school, you know, that called the triumphal entry. Uh, <clears throat> what do you think Jesus' thoughts were? Jesus has talked to his disciples as he's approached this, uh, that he's going to have to be arrested, uh, subjected to indignity, and in fact, tortured and killed. But this is a joyous occasion. Do you think in the heart of Jesus, as he rode on this donkey, the adulation of the crowd was 
tainted in any way by what Jesus knew was to come. Well, Jesus definitely knew because it was prophesied. Yeah. So he knew the end of his life was coming up very, very shortly. So he must have had some sadness there, you know, inside. Even though on the outside it might have been joyous. I wonder, was this, you think, an encouragement to Jesus? Or was he more cynical about it and saying, they don't really understand. They're expecting me to start a revolution now. Uh, we've made a holiday of this occasion in the, in the history of <laughs> the Christian religion. Uh, anyway, it, his, his response here is he, he weeps over the city. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So it was, it, it, it's a joyful parade. Everybody loves a parade, and yet it's tempered with that. It's really like the beginning of a death march. <laughs> yeah. This is what started the march to the cross, pretty okay. much. It's going to be unfolding in the next uh, several chapters. We'll leave it there with that question. Uh, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace. What would bring you peace? We, pay, we pray for world peace. We pray for peace in our lives, peace in our community, peace in our nation. And so we'll, we'll start right there next time. What brings peace? Is it uh, the right uh, government? Is it... Uh, you know, the people get along, or you know, what? What brings peace? So, okay, thank you for your wisdom and your comments. We're moving uh, slow but sure. Here's our hymn. It came upon the midnight clear. Can you, Matt? We'll start it. <clears throat> Oh, okay. <clears throat> it came upon the midnight clear and glorious summer glow. From ancient and near, through tall shadows of blue, he saw the earth could hear to me. Thank you.
Thank you. I love singing together with all of you. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you for the lesson. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Yeah, that's the. I think it's supposed to be the world.